Welcome to my CEH version 9 lab or book review. We're doing the SaveX book. We're dealing with chapter 13, which is web server and applications. So this is always a fun chapter because we get to talk about more of the server and application side of things. So for a client server type layout, typically we have different roles. And those roles could be like a server administrator, network administrators, all of the appropriate end users, application administrators. So these roles are more of like what you'd be giving to a user, not to what you'd be giving to a server. So if we're looking at specifically a web server, web servers deliver content over HTTP and HTTPS. Basically, there it's a file server that is responding on two particular ports. The web server supports different types of content and multiple web server platforms exist. Uh, IIS, Apache, or two of the big two. IIS is the Microsoft version. Apache is more of the open source slash Linux, though you can have Apache on Windows Apache by far is the largest share of the market, so most more and more things are going with Apache. So some of the security features built in for the, uh, Apache, authentication, SSL and TLS support, URL rewritten, uh, request filtering, IDSs, IPSs, logging. For the application support, Python, Perl, PHP are the big ones. For IIS, honestly, a security feature, they're pretty much the same thing. Security uh, certificate support, authentication support, SSL, TL, TLS support, application development, again, very, very similar to Apache, even though uh, IIS has a few more built in, like the database support and uh, the appropriate protocol listeners. One nice thing with IIS, it does support legacy technologies, though you can get Apache to do the same thing. Web applications are gonna be specific software that's typically installed on top of a web server designed to respond to specific requests. Uh, a web application could be a remote desktop uh, over the web. It could be mobile apps. It could be browser-based. So a server application is hosted on a web server and is designed to access remotely via a web browser or web-enabled application. QuickBooks over the web is a good example. It's sitting on top of a server but it's specifically designed to be accessed via a web browser. So the server sits on the web server, information is stored and accessed on that web server, processing is done on the server itself, the end result is delivered to the end user via the web browser. Applications can be made for one or multiple platforms and they can actually be coded for several platforms very similar to cloud services, things like infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, DRC as a service. So there's a cloud model that's becoming more and more of a concern. Well, not really concern, but taking over. And this is more about being able to share resources and dynamically be able to allocate and share those resources based on demand or based off of the uh, features that one wants to purchase. So let's look a little bit closer at web applications. So we're dealing with specific layers, seeing like the presentation layer and the sub layers, logical and data. All of these layers, layers depend on technology brought to the table from things like uh, WWW, 
the appropriate HTML versions, and HTTP slash HTTPS. All of these deal with delivering content over the internet to a web browser. What's so, one of the next things is our browsers actually store information that we've got from servers via a cookie. So cookies are used to store data from previously uh, visited sites. These cookies hold uh, state information. Information can be exposed to a hacker. It just goes back to what type of information is stored on a cookie. And it could be just auto filled data, sometimes usernames, sometimes not. It depends on the browser and the security level of the browser. So keep that in mind. Insecure cookies could allow for theft. Again, modern day browsers don't kind of have that uh, mitigated now. So older browsers, yes, newer ones, no. It's very commonly uh, used technique to look at cookies, to capture cookies, to see what information we can get from them. So different pieces could be things like our login, our permissions, session, data access or storage, or the, even just the logic of that process. So common problems with applications designed for the web. Flawed web design, too much revealed in the code. That's a big one. It not being coded correctly or securely. It actually may map out connection information. It may allow for buffer overflow, whether it be software or just an exploit that was built in. Other things, uh, because we're accessing more and more applications via the web, we could be looking at possible denial, denial of server attacks, denial of service attacks, or even a distributed denial of service attack. That's where they just start trying to max out the resources for the web server. Thus, it's not being able to respond to legitimate requests anymore. You can also do things like banner grabbing. If you go to see uh, a particular website, you may try to grab its banner. You may want to see what server it's running, what version of server it's running, updates, things like that. Because for example, if you know it's running IIS, you can actually then scale down the amount of possible vulnerabilities that you'd be looking at. If you're attacking IIS, you're not going to be throwing things that will work with Apache on it because you're running IIS or you're targeting IIS. So you want to run known exploits for IIS. And then again, the version of IIS even comes into play. It doesn't specifically have to be IIS. It could be Apache, but again, same thing is going to apply. Banner grab will give you the server information and typically the version. That way, is it Apache 10? Is it IIS 6, 7, 8, 8.5? And thus, you can then narrow down the vulnerability or the exploit that you're going to be using against it, thus narrowing down your scope. Error messages are very important because depending on the error message, it may reveal too much. It may not reveal enough information. So you want to make sure that it is at least displaying enough information for it to do its job. Common flaws in attack messages, it could just be misconfiguration or it could be input validation uh, issues. So depending on what you're trying to do, misconfiguration, I've set up IIS before and I misconfigured it. I happened to disable directory browsing when I wanted it enabled. Thus, the site that I was looking at no longer allowed for browse directories, and so it actually caused some errors. Input validation, that's always a big one. I may do a user logon page, but 
I may allow any code to be executed where the username is. You can actually do input uh, verification and validation. Thus, I'm expecting an email address, something at domain.extension. So I can build out that input validation by anything at anything dot anything. And I could be looking for that specific, that specific string. And thus, if it does not come in that order, it's not valid. So if I'm looking for something at gmail.com and I get something dot something dot something, it's like, wait, I'm expecting something at gmail.com. I'm not seeing an at sign, invalid. Maybe throw an error, may, maybe throw a, hey, re-input this. So input verification is kind of important. Uh, you could also do that with like phone numbers. I could prompt for you to enter a phone number, three hyphen three hyphen four. I could set the structure based off of input verification and input validation. All depend on how the coder of the website is actually verifying the consistency of that data. Cross site scripting is a very common type of attack that occurs in different types of forms. It's normally when you get data uh, to a web application through untrusted sources. Two major types, stored attacks and reflected attacks. Stored attacks could be code into a web page that you're viewing. Thus, once you load the web page, you execute the code. Or a reflected attack, this could be something like coming from an email. This occurs when a party injects ex executable code within the HTTP response. Normally Java or VB script, but it doesn't have to be. Coding and design flaws. A big part of this, honestly, is verification and validation that was done very poorly. It could also be redirecting of users to locations that you really didn't want them uh, relocated to, i.e. untrusted locations, or things like insecure logons. We didn't do uh, a secure logon via HTTPS. We allowed usernames and passwords to be sent via plain text. S sadly, that's very common. Scripting issues, it could be things like uh, allowing nulls when you shouldn't be allowing nulls, uh, sampling scripts, uh, poorly written scripts, poorly written code, questionable scripts. When you just start copying and pasting off the internet, run certain things, but you don't know what the code really does. That's always a fun one. Uploading incorrect items that could cause harm later down the line. Bombs. Worms. All right, so one of the last major things we have to talk about is some of the uh, other major issues with cookies. Things like how secure they are, path, domains. Uh, are they being secured via HTTP or HTTPS? Uh, do they expire? How often do they expire? Are we verifying that once they are expired, they're really actually expiring? A session hijacking is always a big one because you can always embed additional information in a URL that can get session IDs, thus allowing session hijacking to take place. So there's a lot when it comes to web applications, and we're actually going to do more about this in our labs. Uh, we have a few Pineapple Labs coming up, just because, again, being able to capture the session IDs, being able to perform a man in the middle, they're not super hard, but it's something that everyone should have the experience of doing to see the easiness of it or to see the how complex it may seem on paper, but in actually reality, how it really isn't. So again, make sure you understand basic web applications, web server definitions, cookies, and things of that nature. All right, this is chapter 13 in a nutshell. Thank you.